quickly before I get started. I did this recording and then when I came to edit it, I realized that the entire video was completely saturated and out of focus. So I'm just going to throw up some stock footage because it's a long video and I'm not re-recording the entire thing when I've just done several recordings. So um, yeah, not that that's relevant, but just so I've shared that. Hello there, welcome back to the channel. This is Nerdworld and continuing the story, the ongoing saga of the rivalry between the Romulan and Klingon empires beginning initially with an episode on basically the who would win in a fight and now a breakdown. We're starting with the navies and I'll probably move on to covering some of their weapons and a few other aspects before this series is concluded. If there are any ships or other things that you think I've not covered or I'm not going to cover, please feel free to leave them in the comments below and I will do my very best to get to them. But bear in mind, both these powers have a lot of ships and there's a lot of lore, there's a lot to cover. And I might not do every ship, so when I'm concluded, if I am done, you think there's a ship I should have covered because the Discovery era introduced a lot of new Klingon designs, but the Romulans are a little more lacking in substance sometimes. We know less about their overall fleet disposition. This tends to make me think we should probably make it a bit more balanced. So I'm going to focus primarily on the primary ships of both powers for the most part. This one is on the Vorcha class attack cruiser, the successor vessel to the earlier Katinga class battle cruiser and generally an improvement for the Klingon defense forces. So let's begin with the reasons why a ship like this might have been needed by the Klingons. This vessel was developed sometime in or around the early 2360s. It was, as I said, the successor to previous known generations of Klingon ships such as the Katinga class battlecruiser which was still in service at this time, at least would become an auxiliary vessel of the Klingon Defence Force, but at the time of the development, of course, they were still one of the principal vessels, but they were getting a bit long in the tooth. You've got powers like the Federation developing ships such as the Ambassador class cruiser, and yes, the Ambassador class technically is a cruiser, not strictly a vessel of exploration. Had its flaws, had its issues, but it was a cruiser. Now the Federation and the Klingons are allies, but the Klingons and the Romulans, they're not. Now we know that around this time the Romulans were in a long state of isolation, but even with their isolation, their old hatred, their old arguments with the Klingons never truly went away, and the two powers would have on and off border conflicts and little incursions over one another's territories over the years. Probably the Klingons knew more about what was happening with the Romulans than the Federation did. So, the Klingons at some point decided they needed to update their navy. This included new generations of bird of prey, but also a new generation of frontline combat cruiser, and enter the Vorcha. It was roughly comparable in many ways to a Federation Galaxy-class starship, even taking many notes from the development of the Galaxy-class project, including, for example, there was a technical exchange between the two powers. These Klingon ships were substantially faster. They had a maximum capability of warp 9.5, very close to that of a Galaxy class. They were also long range and for a Klingon ship, fairly luxurious. They had individual crew quarters. They had even the barrack quarters for the lower crew were a bit bigger, more spacious, and they were seen to have um, by Klingon standards, but bear in mind this is all by Klingon standards, not by any human standard of comfort, but they did have comfortable quarters, sometimes with their own replicators. They had uh, seating areas in the quarters, they had multiple more comfortable beds, again by Klingon standards. These ships were considered luxurious, they had about 26 decks, but they may have had a little more, sources are a little unclear. The vessel's overall length was again close to that of a Galaxy-class starship. But the really interesting things about this vessel, because it's a Klingon ship, are of course its weapons. But this was an effort by the Klingons to make a ship that was less like the old battle cruisers that were built for nothing but war, and take a few notes from the Federation and make the vessel a little bit more versatile. As a result, these vessels would initially be more widely used by Klingon governors, members of the High Council, and of course one of them would serve as the Klingon flagship under Chancellor Kimpek until his assassination and then replacement by Chancellor Gowron who would also go on to use this vessel as his personal flagship. Under Gowron, these vessels would see 
a massive amount of investment. The Klingons would build lots of these ships. They would only be replaced as the principal flagship of the Klingon Navy when the Nekvar was developed, again under the instructions of Chancellor Gowron. That, that the Vorchas position within the Navy was already secured. It was a main cruiser designed for attack and defensive roles. It was a long-range, multi-purpose tactical assault vessel. The likes of which the Klingons simply hadn't had before and it was a superior ship in many ways to the predecessors. So looking at many of the vessel's capabilities again, it's quicker, it's more agile, it's more heavily armed. It doesn't have anything particularly special about its weaponry compared to its predecessors, except maybe for one area. Other than power, of course, being more modern. It had very advanced shields, it had an advanced cloaking device which was more advanced than anything that had come before it at the time of its development. But the vessel's real strength was its weaponry. The principal weapons of the vessel was a bow-mounted primary disruptor capable of firing beam and pulse form. This was stronger than any of the other weapons on the ship. It also, like the D7s and Katingas before it, had wing-mounted disruptor cannons mounted near to the warp nacelles. These were fed power by the ship's main power distribution grid to enhance their strength. It also had forward and aft torpedo launchers as well as other auxiliary disruptors and like many Klingon ships they would often see customization, which might include additional forward torpedo launchers in the prow. The vessel's bridge was located like many Klingon vessels at the front of the ship on top, much like the Federation, but it was mounted in the traditional position of the Klingon ships in a sort of forward command boat of the vessel. In some ways Klingon ships had this in common with the Federation. If you look at the basic breakdown, at least look at it in terms of not aesthetic but in function, you've got the command or drive section, command section, you have a neck separating it from the drive section of the ship where the engines and other mechanical components of the vessel are. In the Federation this is done with the saucer section, the neck and the engineering hull. With the Klingons it's done with a forward protruding sort of mount on the end of a longer neck which then connects it to the rear engineering section of the vessel. This divide is for safety just like it is within the Federation <clears throat> but this vessel saw substantial thickening of the neck and strengthening of the structural integrity of the vessel in order to weather more extensive damage from the Klingon's enemies. These ships would see extensive service in the defense of the Klingon Empire against many enemies, foreign and domestic, during the Klingon Civil War, and most importantly during the Klingon Cardassian War, and then during the Greater Dominion War, where these vessels would show their strengths extensively. These vessels were phenomenally powerful and easily a match for many of the Dominion ships that they went up against. It was only outclassed in the Klingon Navy, as I said, by the Nekvar. But the Vorcha proved itself against the Jem'Hadar and definitely against the Cardassians and the Breen, with its formidable firepower speed, maneuvering, and general Klingon badassery, which is, you know, an integral mechanical element to every Klingon ship that they build. It's just general level of, we're gonna kick your ass and we look like it, be afraid, we're coming, kind of look. The vessel has a narrow profile and actually the design of the ship is subtly genius. No matter what angle you're looking at the ship from, and even from dorsally or ventrally where the ship would be at its largest profile, because of how all the different components of the ship connect together, there's no one particularly good target. The hard targets of the ship are heavily armoured and heavily shielded. The more spindly areas that look more vulnerable, because they are, are harder to hit because they're thinner, and with the ship manoeuvring and speed, and quite frankly those sections can be more lost during a combat and the vessel remain tactically effective. The vessel is crewed, of course, by many Klingons and a huge cohort of Klingon warriors. It also has auxiliary craft, which will typically be shuttles, but the Klingons are known to produce some kind of fighter, but I don't know much about those, so the vessel pretty much just had shuttles as its primary auxiliaries. And that is the Klingon Vorchak class attack cruiser, one of the mainstays of the Klingon Imp naval defense forces, which I think I've just pronounced incorrectly. The Klingon defense force? That's the, that's the one, this is the general Klingon defense force. And personally I think it's an awesome ship and it reflects a more modern, more developed and refined Klingon empire for the 24th century. This ship would continue to serve from at least the 2360s through to the early 25th century. And being Klingon, probably beyond even that.
I just want to take this moment to thank you for watching that video. If you liked what you saw, please check out my social links in the description box below to Instagram and Twitter and others. And there also is down there a link to my Patreon page where you can support this channel and the others as I try to grow this franchise and do this more regularly. If you made it all the way to the end of this video, thank you for watching and bye bye.